All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our June Community Impact Breakfast. We have a jam-packed agenda for you today as we go through our elected official discussion. We are using a new platform today for those of you that join us on a regular basis. We've switched to the webinar model of Zoom, and so it's going to look and feel a little bit different for both the panelists and the attendees today. So um, please feel free to let us know in the chat box if you have any questions, but we are excited about this platform and being able to do some different things than we could do before. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started today. Um, as I noted, there is that chat box there and we do want to encourage you to use that, but we are going to ask that you keep it positive. We know there's a lot of difficult conversations happening in our communities right now. This is a space where we want to have a really productive and positive dialogue that leads to our community being even stronger. So appreciate you staying positive and engaged in that chat box and keeping those comments very favorable to our attendees and to each other. We will be asking you at the end as we do some fire round questions of all of our panelists to um, play in the chat box. We're going to ask you to answer some questions too. So we encourage you to be engaged during that time. I do want to take a quick moment and thank all of our incredible sponsors that are investors in the chamber on the screen right now. You can see there is a large group of businesses that believe in the work of our business community and invest wholeheartedly with us every year. So I want to take a moment to thank CES, the City of Arvada, Apex, Morning Story, Arvada Economic Development, PBS, Wealth Management, Mankey, Super Credit Union, and a number of our other investors that you can see listed on the screen. We can't do the work that we do without the support of our sponsors. And as you all know, the Chamber has been busy at work for the past few months responding to the impacts of COVID-19. On this screen here, there's a few Chamber updates that I wanted to bring to your attention. The first is we have launched in partnership with the City of Arvada and Adams County a mini grant program. So if your business hasn't applied for that yet, I would encourage you to do so. Um, you can get funds for technology usage, operations, as well as compliance that maybe you've incurred during this time. We'll put the link in the chat box for you to find that information online. We also encourage you to take the Safe and Open Pledge, which is a partnership with the Arvada Resiliency Task Force, if you haven't had a chance to do that yet. And then finally, as we move forward as an organization, we've reimagined what the Chamber needs to be to support where you are today as our business community. So I would encourage all of you to visit our eight ways the Chamber will drive economic recovery blog that again will be in the chat box for you here in just a few minutes. So with that, I wanted to give you kind of a quick overview of what today is going to look like. We are going to squeeze a lot into an hour and 15 minutes. And so I appreciate everybody kind of buckling up for this journey. Um, I am going to be moderating today, so I appreciate a little bit of grace from both the attendees and the panelists as we try to squeeze really quick timed responses through a lot of different questions that have been posed to these elected officials. We are going to start with opening remarks, so each of our panelists today will get two minutes to update the, us on their lane of work. We're then going to move into a question and answer section. These questions have been posed by members of our Government Affairs Committee that are going to help to kind of guide a discussion of where we're going within our community. And then we're going to end on a really positive note with some fire round questions. And we're going to ask each of the attendees or in the panelists to respond to those um, in their own way. So that would be fun to hear everybody's responses there. I do know we have a lot of elected officials that have joined us today, so I'm going to introduce our panelists as well as recognize a few that are joining us as attendees. So first and foremost, thank you Congressman Ed Perlmutter, State Representative Tracy Kraft Tharp, State Representative Brianna Titone, Senator Rachel Zenzinger, Mayor Mark Williams, Jefferson County Commissioner Leslie Dahlkamper, Libby Zabo and Casey Tai, Arvada Fire Board Member Jim Whitfield, Apex Park and Recreation District, Liz Tomsola, and RTD board member, Shelly Cook. So that will be our panel. As far as additional elected officials who joined us today, we have from Arvada City Can Council, Nancy Ford, Fire Chief Mike Piper, um, Arvada Fire Board member, Bob Leverage, and um, we probably have a few more that I've missed, and I'll try to catch you all as we go through this and make sure I recognize you as we round up the event. Feel free to put your name in the chat box so that I can see that. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. 
As I noted, we're going to start with the panelists' opening remarks, and we're going to start with Congressman Ed Perlmutter. So on the screen, we're going to put up a timer. So each of the participants are going to get a timer. They have agreed to stick to those timers, and I've been told that I can be mean if I have to, which I don't intend to. But Congressman, you get to set the tone for us today. Go ahead and get us started with your two minutes of opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Cami. Uh, really appreciate being part of this panel. Other panels, we've been over at the uh, Arvada Center. Uh, today, we're doing it by Zoom, which is reflective of how different a moment we're in here in America and in Colorado. But I think I want to start with the fact that Americans and Coloradans have really stepped up to the plate generally to fight this virus and to reduce its impact, even though its impact is giant. Uh, here in America and all across the globe. And as a congressman, I've been working on all sorts of things, but I want to talk about the, num the different packages we passed from trying to deal with the healthcare and medical emergency to dealing with then the economic uh, consequences uh, that this virus has uh, caused to all of us. The, we managed to get out a big package that helped uh, uh, prepare and develop a lot of protective gear. Uh, we were way behind the eight ball uh, when it came to that. We have now made advances on vaccines and medicines. We're not uh, to the breakthrough yet, but we're getting there. We put out a lot of money to a lot of people, businesses and individuals over a very short period of time. There are a couple things left that we have to do. One is uh, passed the HEROES Act. And in the HEROES Act, I have a strong big piece, which is for uh, state governments, local governments, and school districts to try and help backfill the revenue that uh, is lost all across our state and across the nation. Also, we have a big infrastructure package that we'll be voting on next week or the week right before the 4th of July. And that will be very helpful for a couple purposes. One, to make our state and the nation uh, as competitive as possible for the next 50 years, but put a lot of people to work. So there is a lot to be done, but a lot to be proud of so far as we've gotten through this emergency phase. And with that, I'll yield back to you, Cami. Thank you so much. You did great. Two minutes goes very, very fast. And it looks like the mayor is going to hold people accountable to their time. So I don't have to. That's perfect. Uh, next up is State Representative Tracy Craftsart. Good morning. Good morning, Arvada Chamber. I can hardly wait to see you all again. Um, I'm Tracy Kraftharp, and I'm the state representative in House District 29, which is north and east Arvada, the Jefferson County part of Westminster. I'm also a candidate for Jefferson County Commissioner uh, District 1, and I know that um, we have other county commissioner candidates in the audience, and maybe they can stand up later, Cami, and introduce themselves. Um, state legislature went back into session for three weeks, um, just finished up this last Monday. So I know that our mayor, Mark Williams, will probably talk about his recovery this week from his late night. We had lots of late nights um, in the session and I'm still recovering also. Rachel, Brianna and I, I think we'll be talking about some of the work that we did. Uh, really worked on the budget, $3.3 billion in cuts. Uh, worked on, um, on um, School Finance Act, and then worked on COVID-related bills, which I know we're going to do some talking about. Um, I just want to let you know that this is my eighth year in the legislature, and Monday was my last day in session. So kind of a surreal experience, pretty sad, um, but very proud of some of the work that I've been able to do, um, especially around um, businesses and um, the small business community. As you know, I served not only as the chair of the Business Affairs and Labor Committee, but also as the chair of the Sales Tax uh, Simplification Task Force, that uh, we will be having a bill um, signed to extend that task force for five years. Won't be meeting this year because we're all focused around COVID, but we'll be meeting for the next five years to really look at simplifying our sales tax system. Um, I have 14 seconds left, but just let me tell you that I saw a demo of the sales tax database system yesterday, and it is amazing. Looking forward to our VADA jumping in and participating and all the businesses. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. 
Thank you, Representative. I appreciate it and appreciate your eight years of service at the legislature. That's amazing. I know that's a huge commitment. We're grateful. Next up, I'd like to welcome State Representative Brianna Titone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Cami, for having me here today. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, we had an abbreviated session. Uh, 35 days were left on the calendar, even though it felt like uh, an eternity uh, of being here. And uh, there were a lot of things that were different uh, from my first year to my second year. One of them was uh, this whole COVID timeout period where things were really different. Uh, and what we really focused on was trying to get information to people and, uh, and make sure that they knew what was going on uh, with, with all the new rules and changes. Uh, we helped a lot of the businesses and, and uh, people with their unemployment insurance. Uh, and we had a lot of, uh, a lot of good bills that actually did still go through. Uh, some of my bills did end up getting on the chopping block, but we did do a limited liability of food donations. So uh, there was no liability to donate food to, to nonprofits. Uh, I had one about school transcripts, uh, very important right now because uh, people aren't taking those tests. I uh, had one on, on safe to tell, making meaningful changes to safe to tell. Uh, to make sure that those calls get routed the right place. Uh, also close the loophole on insurance to make sure people don't get discriminated against. And then we had all of our COVID related relief bills and, and response bills, uh, the price gouging bill uh, that I sponsored and, and as well as a few that I co-sponsored, uh, the delinquent in, uh, interest payment property tax bill. So uh, you won't be punished with interest and in, in, uh, penalties if you are, are late on your your property taxes, uh, and then also food pantry assistance and small business recovery loan program. Those are bills that I co-sponsored. Uh, and we, we did a lot more than that. There's just not enough time to go through a, a lot of these bills that we did. Uh, but we, we really tried to make the best of this time to make sure that we were uh, doing meaningful bills that were relief to the people. So thank you so much for the time today. Thank you, Representative. Appreciate your service. Next up, we have Senator Rachel Zinsinger. Please give us a two minute update. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm actually uh, down at the Capitol right now. Today, the Joint Budget Committee is meeting for our June quarterly forecast. Um, speaking of the Joint Budget Committee, uh, I spent about um, three weeks down here at the legislature um, in advance of the opening for our abbreviated session, uh, where we spent another three weeks um, in session. So about, I would say, five weeks and Mm, six days of that uh, was uh, me working on the budget <laughs> and um, it was a very trying experience uh, given how different things are with with COVID. Um, back in January we were about 800 million dollars over the Tabor cap and it was promising to be a, a pretty um, exciting year for some uh, important goals. And then in March, we ended up being about um, having $23 million. Um, and then in, in a week later, we ended up being about $3.3 .3 billion in the hole. So it was a pretty dramatic change um, trying to adjust and figure out how we were going to balance the state budget given those realities. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out. Um, I, I'm going to have to hop off the call a little early uh, for that June for, quarterly forecast. So I wanted to make sure to give my thank yous now to everybody. Um, I think one of the things that this, this crisis has really um, stood out for me is, is how people really work to come together and how um, our Arvada Chamber did a tremendous job with that. Um, just a stellar job. I think that um, our business community in Arvada in general um, really was a, a shining example of how people can come together and stay connected and offer up resources. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Senator. We appreciate all of your hard work for us. Next up is no stranger to all of you, Mayor Mark Williams. Well, thank you, Cami, and I'll echo what uh, Rachel just said. She uh, stole my thunder in terms of my thanks to the chamber and you in particular, Cami. You have you have been a shining star and a real rock star for us in this. And I want to welcome the 80 participants who have joined us today 
It's because of this great chamber of commerce that can bring us all together on these important issues. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I did not discuss a little trash talk here for just a second or two. We did indeed have a lengthy city council meeting. Uh, I, according to uh, our historian, Mark McGough, it's the longest city council meeting in modern history. We went until 2.45 uh, Tuesday morning on a very difficult and frankly a subject that has divided the community to, a, to a, an extent that I wish it hadn't. It's a situation where uh, we had gotten plenty of feedback from our sustainability committee and others that we needed to explore a single hauler trash system. Uh, our city team did an excellent job of researching it, putting together a contract. There are people who are pro and con on this. And we had a split vote on city council four to three on the issue, uh, which ultimately did pass. And we, have entered into, we are entering into a contract with Republic. Um, but I can tell you the bright spot for me out of all this is after the debate, uh, first of all, we were able to listen to our citizens. We got plenty of feedback, but we had a split vote, but we do not have a split council. We have a council that uh, I think came through that process with greater respect for each other. We listened to each other. We understood where each other were coming from. And as I have publicly said in the newspaper, Although there may be recall efforts out against the four who supported this, that is not appropriate. These were policy decisions. These were good-hearted people. Uh, please, do not please do not sign recall petitions if they actually end up happening. That's, that's my comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. We appreciate that update. Next up, we have Jefferson County Commissioner Leslie Dahlkamper. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Cami, and thanks to the Arveta Chamber for hosting this morning's conversation. It's good to see you. Um, we've got all three county commissioners this morning, and we thought we'd divide and conquer. I'm going to talk a little bit about small business grants. Commissioner Zabo is going to touch on variances. And Commissioner Tai is going to talk about an issue that I think has been weighing heavily on all of our minds, and that's how we continue to work together to fight systemic racism. We'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing on a county level. First, I have to give a huge shout out to the members of the Jeffco Business Recovery Task Force, which played a critical role in shaping grants for small businesses. County commissioners set aside $5 million for locally owned businesses. Those are businesses in unincorporated Jeffco. And a few Saturdays ago, I had an opportunity to knock on the doors of nearly 30 small businesses to uh, raise awareness about the grants. And business owners talked uh, with me, and I know many of our elected officials have talked with our, our local businesses as well, about how hard this pandemic has hit them and how they're working to weather uh, this period of time. In fact, an owner of a dry cleaning business said her, her business was down 80% significant impact. And she also added that the grants wouldn't help her because she was only one full-time employee. So we take that feedback to heart. Commissioners heard the same concern from other businesses. And we uh, changed and lowered the number of full-time employees to one. We've extended the deadline to June 30th. And uh, you can visit jeffco.us to, to find out more. So far, we've had 300 applicants. We want even more. We encourage you to apply. We want to get those CARES Act dollars um, in your hands. We've also increased the grant from 5,000 per business to 10,000. And we'll have more updated information on the website about that next week. Jeffco's Chambers of Commerce, including the Arvada Chamber, have done an extraordinary job of helping businesses navigate these difficult times. We're also looking at CARES Act dollars for our chambers as well. And we want to thank Congressman Perlmutter, members of the Colorado Congressional Delegation, delegation our mayor, city councils, Jeffco schools, and others for the tremendous uh, partnership in Jeffco. Thanks so much. I'm going to wrap it up because I know the mayor is going to start giving me that timeout sign in a second. Thanks, Cammie. <laughs> Thank you so much, Commissioner. Appreciate that. Next up, we have Commissioner Zabo. I'm going to do a quick check in with you. Commissioner Zabo, can you hear us okay? All right, we might come back to Commissioner Zabo. Commissioner Natai, can I pick on you next? And we'll circle back to Commissioner Zabo. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. And, and today is Juneteenth. So I wish everyone a happy Juneteenth. Uh, if you don't know, Juneteenth is a, a recognition and celebration of the end of slavery. Uh, even though the Emancip Emancipation Proclamation was uh, signed in 1863, many slaves were not freed until much later than that. And on June 19, 1865, slaves in Texas were informed 
that they were free and no, on, no longer under the, uh, the horrible institution of slavery. Uh, Juneteenth is a, a recognition of, the, of that positive movement. And we know now that we still have a long way to go. So happy June, Juneteenth to everyone. Uh, the Jefferson County Board of County Commissioners issued a, pro, uh, a letter, a letter uh, talking about uh, racism and trying to end the systemic racism as Commissioner Del Camper talked about this. Much like many of you, we issued a letter discussing this issue. And, and we said that our hearts are filled with overwhelming grief and outrage over the brutal death of George Floyd at the hands of four Minneapolis police officers who took an oath to preserve and protect. Uh, the senseless violent acts of racial injustice have widespread repercussions. And we stand with others in our community in taking action to end racial discrimination. In Jefferson County and elsewhere, peaceful protests amplify the voices of black Americans and other people of color who are victims of injustice. We reject police brutality and racism of all kinds. The letter goes on to talk about many different issues. We, we, we wanna make sure we recognize the good men and women in law enforcement who put their lives on the line daily to protect our communities. And we congratulate Sheriff Schrader who has strong anti-bias policing standards that are a, a, a national standard. We support the Sheriff's ongoing commitment to engage in thoughtful conversations and communications with our community and improve, improving police practices. We invite you to join us in this effort to ensure that Jefferson County is an inclusive and vibrant community. You can read the whole statement on our website, but we want to work with you in, on ending racial injustice in Jeffco and, and in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Next up, we have Commissioner Zabo. So we'll try this again. Commissioner, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I hear you perfectly. Thank you okay, so good. much, Commissioner. Go ahead with your two minute opening remarks. Yes, I, you know, I want to thank you all. I'm having a little struggle getting on. So uh, I, I think I'm voice and picture only. But yeah, I just want to commend all the the, you know, the businesses in Jefferson County who took advantage of the, the CARES Act and were able to uh, sign up for our grants. We need more, like Commissioner Dahl Camper said, um, and because um, we need to get the word out. So if any of you out there can help get the word out. I'm going to speak a little bit about our variants. Actually, yesterday we filed a second variance to open up some more businesses in the county. But our first variance is in effect right now. We don't know when we will get our second variance granted. So let's all cross our fingers and hope it gets granted. But right now in gatherings, we can have up to 50 people inside and up to 125 people outside. Also places of worship have the capacity of 50% or 50 people inside, just like gatherings or 125 outside. And um, Praise from all the gyms and um, pools. They are so excited to be open and to get out there and start exercising again the way that they're used to. And they are allowed to have 50 people in each room. So what our second variance does is it allows us to increase to 175 people indoors, 250 people outdoors. We're gonna try to move, uh, open up movie theaters and performing arts. Libraries may open under this um, variance and spectator sports up to 250 people. But we all have to remember, we need to follow the guidelines that are put out, keeping our hands clean, wearing our mask, um, being separated um, by six feet from each other. So Jeffco, go out and get them. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate those updates. Next up, we have our VADA Fire Board member, Jim Whitfield. Good morning, Cami, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this morning. If you hadn't noticed uh, this past year, we've been pretty busy on the, uh, in the fire department and on the fire board. We've, um, we've seated a, a new chief. Uh, we've uh, gone through some negotiations with some of our other local agencies, and uh, we've uh, maintained our reaccreditation. And, and quite frankly, that is all due to fantastic leadership from our previous board in its, in its leadership, our interim chief, who's now our new chief, uh, Chief Mike Piper, and, uh, and of course, all of our firefighters and, uh, and all our other first responders in the community. So what a great testament <clears throat> that we were able to get through a difficult year 
and, uh, and, and, and come as far as we have. Uh, in light of the pandemic, again, great, a great thanks to our firefighters and our, and our, fire, our fire leadership. Uh, we have an adequate amount of PPE um, and we've, uh, we have no firefighters in quarantine right now. We, we, we were quarantining uh, our staff as appropriate as we were responding to, uh, to those that were ill. Um, with regard to that, the, the, at present, the number of calls are down. And what we're seeing is that those people that we're responding to are very, very sick and very ill. So we would encourage people to realize that going to the hospital if you're very sick or very ill is a good thing. And uh, we, we'd, we'd, we'd like to respond to cats and trees uh, a, a bit more than, than what we're doing at present. Um, what we're looking for, forward to in the next year is uh, we've got a new board. It's, it's a powerhouse board. Any one of the five of us could easily, easily be a leader. Uh, it, it, we've got two former city council members, so we're looking forward to that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about some new stations later in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate the update. Next up, we have from Apex Park and Recreation District, Liz Tomsula. Good morning, everyone. I'm stepping in for um, our president, Vicki Pine, who is off to her granddaughter's first dance recital. So it's a really big deal. Um, but my name is Liz Tomsula, secretary treasurer for the Apex Board. Um, as many of you guys know who have visited the Apex facilities, we have been on complete shutdown mode. Um, the COVID pandemic has, has made us really um, reevaluate and rethink how we could reach our community, um, given that facilities are closed. So the amazing staff started an Apex at Home program, which offers a wide range of video programming classes from Spanish lessons, cooking classes, fitness classes. Um, and then we were also able to offer our medical fitness programming classes, which um, are focused for Parkinson's folks and um, folks suffering with MS. And all of those are through a video network, which has been really, really wonderful. Um, over the past few weeks, though, on a more positive note, we've been able to open um, Indian Tree, Arvada Tennis Center, the outdoor pickleball courts, um, Seacrest, including the warm water wellness pool, uh, Fitz Fitzmorris, and then the outdoor pool at Fitzmorris will be opening July 1st, as um, Commissioner Zabo mentions, these variances have been huge for the district to be able to start um, having a sense of normalcy in a very safe env environment. But one thing I really want to focus on is the main Apex Center is actually um, fully a state child care licensing um, facility. And uh, we had a check a couple weeks ago and we were um, given accolades for being the safest site in the area by, by the amazing staff that runs that facilities. Um, every time a child enters it or uses the restroom, there has to be a complete clean of that restroom. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that folks are going through. Um, at that facility, we're offering, also offering childcare for um, first responder children. So it's, it's been a really great community building right there and we're just excited to, to get back out there for everybody. Thank you so much, Liz, for the update. Last but certainly not least, we have RTD board member Shelly Cook. Shelly, are you on the line still? Yes, sorry, I'd forgotten to mute, unmute. Oh, <laughs> you're good, thank you, go ahead. Thank you, um, thanks Cami and all for hosting this and for being part of this uh, forum this morning. So I guess in talking about RTD, uh, my themes today are going to be uh, both challenges and opportunities. So just in a nutshell, I'll talk first about our finances. Um, you know, you may have read about this, Forecasts show a multi-year reduction of revenues over our prior and planned spending levels of more than or almost 200 million for several years running through 2022. It starts to improve after that. Now, we've received CARES Act funding. Thank you, Congressman Perlmutter, so much. Uh, it was the lifesaver for us. That's on an exp expense reimbursement basis, and that should help us for 2020 and help us uh, plan for these subsequent years. But we cannot count on further uh, stimulus, of course, and we know we're facing a potential shortfall of $1.2 over the next six years. 
years. Secondly, an accountability committee. This week, Governor Polis uh, hosted a press conference and announced an accountability committee for RTD that was jointly put forth by the governor legislative leadership in the state and by RTD. Now, this was in response to concerns and issues that had been carried in legislation, excuse me, carried in legislation earlier in the year and um, was still a very pronounced possibility, you know, even after the, the COVID resumption. And we'd been warned about that by our legislative group, including those who are here today. So it was our chair's decision, and it was a wise one, to get in front of it and to recognize the potential benefit of this and to work proactively with the parties. Um, for example, we've been hearing and we know we have to do a better job of partnering with our with our regional stakeholders and other, and other communities and so forth. So here's a chance to actively explore and to do that. And then for what it's worth, the independent view of things like our organizational structure, our HR systems, our finances, et cetera, that could be really valuable, especially right now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Sally. We appreciate your update. And I'll tell you what, for those of you that have attended these events in person, this on-screen timer is amazing. I don't have to hold up that mean stop sign that I usually had to to keep the conversation going. So thank you all for staying so close to that time. That was perfect. And we are right on schedule. So next we're going to move into a question and answer section. And the way this is going to work is we have eight total questions we're going to ask. Each of the participants has the opportunity to um, pick two to three questions, which we did determine ahead of time to help with the flow of the event today. They'll have 60 seconds to answer the question. We'll put the question on the screen for everybody's ability to see that, and I will prompt who's next to answer the question. We're gonna start with the first question, which is within your scope of work, what COVID-19 response are you most proud of? And Representative Kraftsarf is gonna kick us off with her answer. Thank you. So the legislature did pass a package of CARES funded um, bills um, that the governor is planning on signing on Monday morning at 930. Um, those bills range from um, helping people with utilities, helping people with housing assistance. Um, I was proud to be a sponsor of the bill to help with behavioral health issues. In this time of COVID, People are really struggling with uh, mental health responses. The crisis line is saying that they are up 40% in the number of calls that are coming. And so um, $15 million of CARES money will be utilized to be able to help spruce up our crisis line, our telehealth services, um, as well as our regular mental health services. So very proud of that and very proud to have the governor be able to sign those on Monday morning. Thank you, Representative. Next up is Senator Zinzinger. It always takes me a minute to find that mute button. <laughs> so um, yes, Tracy mentioned how we um, passed a, a COVID-related uh, legislative package. Um, I carried as the co-frame sponsor um, approximately five of those bills, two of which um, I think I'm especially proud of. Of. That's the 1413, which is a small business recovery loan program. Um, and uh, this is going to, I think, in my opinion, really help Colorado specifically. Um, I also want to uh, give a big shout out to uh, uh, Congressman Perlmutter for his assistance with the CARES Act. Uh, the, uh, that was just absolutely vital um, to our state. And the Small Business Recovery Loan Program is um, out there to subsidize some of that um, uh, PPP program um, that uh, came to us from the federal government. In addition to that, I also sponsored um, Senate Bill 213, which um, permits our, our restaurants to continue serving uh, alcohol beverages uh, through takeout and delivery. Um, really critical piece of helping to get our restaurants back on their feet again. And then lastly, uh, a, a very critical bill, I think in my mind, is um, House Bill 1422, which was our Colorado Food Pantry Assistance Grant Program. And it's working with great organizations like Community Table, our Arvada Community Food Bank that we have here in our organization to help um, fund food pantries and food banks across the state so that they can actually partner with our local agriculture. Okay, Rachel, community. your time's up. <laughs> oh, uh, I can't even see. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, Mayor, for doing what I didn't have the courage to do. Okay. <laughs> Moving wait, wait on. Wait till I go way back. <laughs> thank you, you can Senator. Totally do it. I know. Those were great updates. I did not want to interrupt you because thank you for all that you accomplished over session. That's amazing. And next up is Commissioner Dahl Kemper. Thanks, Cami. You can cut me off anytime. Um, I, I think one thing we're hearing throughout this conversation is that it is a total team effort, right? Uh, from Congressman Perlmutter and his work on the CARES Act to what we heard from our Jeffco legislators, Representative Kraft Tharp and Senator Zenzinger and others in terms of state dollars to help our communities navigate this pandemic. One thing I think we're proud of as county commissioners is that we are working incredibly quickly to get those CARES Act dollars into the hands of cities, businesses, and nonprofits. And we didn't operate in a vacuum either. We, we sought input from mayors, from businesses, our chambers, and nonprofits. And this close collaboration has allowed us to stay nimble and responsive to issues and concerns that uh, have come up along the way. You heard me mention some of those examples related to our business grants. We're seeing, for example, with the 2.5 million we've set aside for nonprofits, that that may not be enough. They're doing incredible work and we thank them for all they're doing to serve people in need. Uh, their request came at 3.6 million and we're gonna have to look at increasing those dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate your update. Uh, next up, Mayor Mark Williams. Thank you. Yeah, obviously the thing I'm most proud of is what our city was able to do in terms of helping small businesses. When we saw that the, the, the Triple P program had passed, we knew it was going to take a while for those dollars to get particularly to our small businesses. And so we knew we need to throw folks a lifesaver. And we did with the, uh, with the loan and grant program that our city council quickly uh, approved. Our team did a great job of putting this together. There were very few requirements to qualify. You had to have 50 or fewer employees. You had to be a brick and mortar and you had to be in good standing with the city. Uh, and so there wasn't the paperwork that was nat naturally required at the federal level. So we were able to move quickly. We moved out uh, two and a half million dollars uh, immediately. And people pushed a button on the application and had the money in their hands within a couple of days to be able to fund their payroll. And it saved businesses in our data. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Mayor. And last on this question is that Jim Whitfield. So, Kami, in, in the business community, on behalf of the fire department, we obviously want to thank the business community and the community for following the CDC guidelines, right? We, we, we flattened the curve. And we've got a lot more to do, but there's a, a great story to tell there on what we did as a community. From a fire board perspective, we, we can't thank our firefighters and our firefighting leadership uh, enough. We didn't miss a beat. We didn't miss a shift. We had firefighters in quarantine. Uh, we've got adequate equipment. We've got uh, uh, everything where it needs to be. Uh, I haven't got any phone calls about, uh, you know, us not responding to any, any sort of event. So we've, we've done a great job of covering in light of, uh, in light of a, a unparalleled pan pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So we're going to move to the second question, and I think this may be one of the most important questions for us all to take note of today. It's thinking about what challenges we believe we will face as a community in the aftermath of COVID-19, and how can we work towards solutions? So we're going to start with Commissioner Casey Tai to give us a sense of what you see as future challenges that we should all be considering. Well, one of the things I think we need to re remind ourselves is, is this is a, a serious pandemic, and it's, it's really disrupted a lot of things. And we aren't done with it yet, but it is going to eventually end. And as we make decisions going forward, we can't uh, put ourselves in a situation where we're hampering ourselves going forward. Mass transit will return. People will be able to ride trains again. We are gonna be able to gather again in, in large groups and large festivals. So we can't, engage in, in decisions that hamper those activities when this pandemic eventually ends. Uh, in the meantime, though, we have to be vigilant. We're seeing a lot of states are on the rise and, and we can't let our guard down. But I, 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 I want to recognize, I want to make sure we focus on the fact that our economy will come back and we'll, we'll be able to get back to, to life in somewhat normal terms uh, eventually. Just got to stay vigilant right now. Thank you, Commissioner. Next up is Representative Kraft Tharp. Thank you. So I think the biggest challenge for us is going to be to find the new normal. 
What does that look like? This has been pretty surreal that all of a sudden, in one day, everything could shut down and you are home, you are, people are without work, businesses are shut down, and you're home for 10 weeks. And what is this new normal? I really, um, I think people have, have uh, said it earlier, but this is where I really want to commend the Arvada Chamber for their resilience and flexibility and really moving into a community organization and finding that pathway to be able to find, you know, what is that normal now and how can we, we find that? I think that the solution is, is that we need to find, um, it, it's about businesses being able to reopen, it's about finding safe workplaces for workers, but more important, it's being able to find um, security and safety for those um, people that are gonna wanna participate and come out of their houses again. It's finding that new normal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mayor? Thank you. Obviously recovery is uh, top of mind for me in terms of uh, how do we recover as a community in terms of being able to get back to whatever that new normal is, but so that we can get to interact more with each other and certainly that we can get recovery in our businesses. And so the second part of the question is how can we work towards solutions? First of all, right now, maintain the social distancing, do all the steps that the health department's ask, asking us to do so that we don't get a relapse in the fall. That's a major concern because that's gonna set us into a tailspin. So, so please continue to remember that COVID is out there. And then shop at your local stores. Support your local businesses. Do what you can, spending your dollars, tip a little extra. Do those kinds of things to show your support for our businesses and our community. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Next up, Congressman Perlmutter. I think the, the best thing that we can do is to continue to work together and the coordination and the cooperation uh, that I've seen um, among businesses and chambers and the local governments and the state government and the federal government is what's been key to get us through this emergency phase. And as Casey and Mark have said, we're not out of the woods yet. We've got a lot of work to do and there's still going to be some disruption and discomfort and masks and social distancing and all that because this virus is not gone. And we've seen a flare up in Boulder uh, just within the last week or two. So our job is to continue to work together. I think the economic blow uh, that we've uh, taken, uh, we can remedy that. And I think we'll have a big infrastructure package. We need to pass the HEROES Act, which has this assistance to state and local governments and uh, school districts so that we don't have to lay off a whole bunch of people at just the wrong time. But we gotta keep working together. Thanks. Thank you, Congressman. Shelly Cook, you're up next. Thank you, Cami. Um, so of course, from the transit standpoint, one of the big questions and challenges is what will commuter behavior be like after the pandemic? Is it forever altered? I mean, one of RTD's planners um, suggested that the current thinking is the pandemic will have accelerated an existing trend toward telecommuting by 10 years. And then on the other hand, if people do return to the workplace, do they shun transit in favor of driving? And what does that mean in terms of congestion and air quality and the environment and climate change, et cetera? Well, beyond that is the, the question of our revenues and funding and so forth. We've already talked about that. Well, how can we work towards solutions for RTD? We're really fortunate in one way. Um, we've been in the midst of a reimagine effort, and that brings to the table a big, robust capability for gathering information about current and predicted travel data. So we're going to be using that to uh, chart our path forward. Thank you, Shelley. So we're going to move to the next question, which is what policy shifts will be critical for us to achieve economic and community recovery? How can we specifically support our businesses? So as many of you have noted, our businesses have been incredibly hard hit during this pandemic. How do we continue to utilize policy decisions to help them thrive as we move forward? Congressman Perlmutter, you're up first. Well, I, I don't want to sound like a one note, Johnny, but uh, we need to pass the HEROES Act, especially the part which is really based on the HEROES, uh, the, the funding to backfill state, local, and school districts uh, for the revenue shortfall so that we're not laying off teachers, 
or transportation workers or law enforcement or first responders or firefighters. Um, and there's the real potential for that if we don't uh, act pretty quickly here. And so I feel uh, that is a very important component. Secondly, I think the infrastructure piece is uh, key. Uh, it will, you know, make us competitive, uh, help us uh, build America, and it will put a lot of people to work. And we're going to need to do that because this uh, the economy has taken a big hit. We know that. And in working with the governments and the chambers, so uh, we'll get through this and uh, it'll, it'll be okay, but it's gonna take a while. Thank you, Congressman. Liz Tamsola, you're up next on this question. Okay, well, first and foremost, support our local business. Come to an Apex facility, come visit us. Go visit all of these wonderful, wonderful places. We have an old town and all of those things. But as, from a policy standpoint, for the Apex Park and Rec District, which is a special district, rethinking the Gallagher Amendment. Gallagher reform will be very important to special districts like Apex. Um, Apex has 40% of their, our budget is from property taxes and 60% is funded by user fees. So people visiting facilities. Um, you know, the Gallagher Amendment is something that um, by no means am I an expert on it. I think maybe I'll defer to Mr. Whitfield on that one, but I, I do believe that um, it's something that we can really rethink to try to help these, um, these special districts in our community and, and really kind of um, move from the regulations that were set in 1982 for these. Thank you, Liz. Next up is Commissioner Zabo. We don't hear you, you have to unmute. Yep, you're muted. Libby, do you want to unmute? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the buttons on my computer move around and I can't ever find them. So I figured you guys were unmuting me. So could I have my minute back, please? Um, Mayor Williams, thank you. <laughs> I, I, what I want to say is I think in this time of re, re, rebuilding, we really need to make sure that the policies that we make, that we vet them completely and don't push unintended consequences on business who are struggling to get back into the game. Instead of thinking that we, the government, knows what's best for business, we need to let business be business and not micromanage them through policies that might hinder them from getting restarted and moving back. We all need to be safe and we all need to work together, but being a business owner in our family for over 50 years, we knew what we were doing in our business and so does every other business in our data. Thank you, Commissioner. Moving on, Fast and Furious, what can the community and business leaders do to encourage positive civility and dialogue during what we're all expecting to be a big political year? I'm going to start with Senator Zenzinger and also take a moment to thank you for all of your time today. I know you have to jump off to go to the JBC meeting here in a second, so I'll let you go and then we'll say goodbye. Great. So um, I have seven pieces of advice. Uh, I would say think before speaking. Uh, number two, focus on facts rather than beliefs and opinions. Uh, number three, focus on the common good rather than just individual agendas. Uh, number four, I think it's really important that we disagree with each other respectfully. Um, number five, I think it's also important to maintain an openness to others without having hostility. Uh, number six, be respectful of diverse views and groups. And then number seven, embody a spirit of collegiality. And I think um, the Joint Budget Committee is a great example of that. Bipartisan, bicameral, um, in, a, in, a, in a group that definitely doesn't agree with each other 100%, but definitely works to um, be collegial to one another. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that um, I have 100% bipartisan record. And I think it's because good ideas um, operate, um, they don't care what side of the aisle you're on. So I think it's really important that we um, listen to one another and, and embody that spirit of collegiality. 
Thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. And good luck at your meeting. Uh, next up to talk to us about civility is Representative Titone. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, th there is a lot of heated uh, discussions going on, on on a lot of different fronts. And what I really think is important is that we, we take the time to listen to people. Um, you know, just because you may not agree with someone uh, doesn't mean that their point of view is not valid and should be heard. So, you know, we spend a lot of time in my office answering calls and emails and uh, making sure that we're doing a lot of listening and then responding back uh, where we may not always agree, but this is something that we just gonna have to get through by dialogue and, and uh, as Senator Zenzinger said, um, you know, being civil about it and just really uh, trying to see the point of view from the other person's side. Uh, because we may not agree, but we, we can find some common ground if we do have that uh, civil discussion. Thank you, Representative. Last on this question is Commissioner Dahlkemper. Thanks, Cami. For me, I, I think it begins by listening and staying focused on the issues that matter most to our community. Um, you can hear the satellite staff weighing in on this issue because apparently they feel strongly about it as well. Um, I mean, the bottom line is we don't have time um, in Jefferson County for flame throwing politics or finger pointing or blame. You know, our community expects us as they should to work together to find common ground. And I think overall, we do a pretty good job of that. And, and I would agree that the more diversity in thinking, the better informed our policy decisions. And these issues should never become personal attacks. It all boils down to trust, integrity, and relationships. And, and that's how we get it done in Jeffco. Thank you, Commissioner. So we're gonna continue our conversation around COVID-19 and really thinking about kind of what the future looks like around preparedness. So the question is, what do you believe can or should be done to prepare for the future impacts of COVID-19? So how are we as a community positioning ourselves to be successful as we move forward? Congressman Perlmutter, you are up first on this question. Uh, it's our community and it's communities across the nation. I think uh, we have to uh, really devote a lot of resources to finding a vaccine or finding a medicine uh, that treats uh, this disease. And uh, we're doing that. I think there are two uh, major companies that go into clinical trials uh, in July, 30,000 people. One is AstraZeneca and the other is Moderna. And I, that will be uh, key to all of this, I think. In terms of the economy, and the effects that this virus has had on it, we need to make sure our state government and local governments are strong and viable. We need to uh, you know, build things uh, because a lot of people have been laid off over the last uh, three months and we need to put them back to work. And there are a variety of ways to do that. One of them is the infrastructure package. So thanks, Cammie. I may, there's my minute. You did great. Thank you, Congressman. Brianna Titone. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think that if we're going to move forward and be prepared for uh, future impacts, we really need to work together and foster connections and introduce different connections now. And there's a lot of uh, really good creative ideas and, and uh, synergies that are happening between different businesses and, uh, and, and different members of the community. And we need to work on getting those connections out. And I think, you know, uh, organizations like the Chamber especially uh, is a great resource to uh, find different organizations that you can work with. Uh, you know, if your business may not be COVID resistant in, in the sense uh, of, of sustaining through, uh, we need to work together to, to try to keep those businesses open by finding those solutions. And, and we can. Uh, we are resilient. We are creative here. Uh, and we are going to get through it through community and working together. And I'm happy to uh, work with you to, to find those uh, connections if you can't find them elsewhere. Thank you, Representative. Last on this question is Commissioner Dahlkemper. Thanks so much. You heard uh, Congressman Perlmutter talk about the infrastructure package and, and key to this effort is getting people back to work, getting our businesses up and running. 
and doing it in a way that's safe and doesn't bring on a second pandemic. We're already starting to see some numbers peak in uh, other states. Um, so we wanna make sure that we continue that good work to continue to flatten the curve. And a huge thanks to our community for its work on that front. It truly makes a difference and our local businesses are depending on it. Um, also, Group Colorado Concerns, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, which is made up of business leaders around the state, has pulled together a task force. I serve on that task force. And that uh, group is looking at everything from transportation to energy to um, even wildfire prevention issues in, and putting together an infrastructure package and proposal that it will also share with the Colorado congressional delegation as well. I think keeping those lines of communication open across our nonprofits, businesses, elected officials and others really does make a difference in staying nimble and responsive. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. Next question is, what does the future of transportation and infrastructure look like? Should we expect changes? Commissioner Tai, you're up first. Well, first of all, I, I, I appreciate the references to the infrastructure package. That's something we desperately need. You know, there are going to be changes to, to transportation. Um, I, I think we're seeing that, that, that people, you know, the mass transit, I, I referenced that earlier. Uh, they're going to have to adapt to how people want to social distance. They want to keep uh, uh, the, the, the areas clean, and, and we're going to have to adapt to that. But at the same time, we can't build our way out of these uh, challenges. We're still going to have to have sensible development that doesn't just constantly add new highways, constantly add uh, the old way of, of moving people around. I think we're going to have to be in, inventive about how we, we – build different uh, transportation vehicles to allow people to to gather in small groups and not have the great big cars packed full of people but we're still going to have to be able to move large numbers of people in a, an efficient way uh i think we're going to see the uh, more electrification and clean air vehicles as well but we need that infrastructure package congressman perlmutter thank you i appreciate that um someone that's not afraid of this conversation at all shelly cook let's talk about transportation Thank you, and um, I'm glad I followed uh, Commissioner Tai because I share his optimism in some ways. Um, so I'll make a daring prediction. Transit might be better off, and here's why. If you can think back to what's happened in this short period of time since the stay-at-home orders, there have been three striking changes in behavior. The first is we've blocked streets off, and not only have we done that, but people have readily embraced that. They're comfortable with it. It looks to be a great success. Secondly, people are walking more. You know, we're at, they're walking so much that we have to worry about crowding on the sidewalks. And third, there's been a surge in bicycling. Well, all three of those trends, all three of those behaviors are highly correlated with transit use. So if they hold once we return to a normal, I think we may see a greater um, role for transit uh, in terms of mobility for, for people in this region anyway. So thank you, Cami. Thanks for everybody. Thank you, Sally. Next up is Jim Whitfield on this question. So our assets, Cami, need to get from point A to point B in five minutes or less. Through some great analysis this, these past years, we've determined that we need a new fire station out near Candela's, and we're going to rebuild what is station three. So if you go to our website, you can get more information about those. In fact, on June 30th, we're going to have an in-person uh, 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 meeting, community meeting, regarding station, uh, station three. And as more to that, and the infrastructure, <clears throat> we're looking forward to uh, the, the expansion of uh, 72nd Avenue. That will enable uh, our Station 3 assets to, to serve that local area much better. And again, uh, we, you know, we're always looking for, for that as, uh, as roads get uh, aged and, con and, ch and congested. Uh, that obviously uh, uh, would prevent us from being able to serve the community. So we're always uh, intrigued and, and interested to see that uh, improve. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Appreciate that. We're in the home stretch here. So two more questions and we're going to do fire round. If you could communicate one key idea to the community, what would you want them to understand? Uh, Liz Tomsula, you have this first. Okay. So the Apex Park and Rec District is much more than a gym and a recreation center. Um, Apex mission statement includes three elements, emotional, social, and physical well-being. We are a fully inclusive recreation district, and you'll notice that on our board of directors, we are an extremely diverse group of five members. 
um, <clears throat> who is constantly listening to the community and listening to the needs of our community. We are innovative, we're inclusive to everyone and strive to create a community where everyone feels safe and supportive. And overall, we strive for, for well-being. We want to live in a healthy community. We want folks to, to be excited about trying a new activity or taking um, Spanish language classes or learning to cook something that they didn't think that they would be able to. Um, and, and we're just really excited and proud about um, the diverse range of, of um, you know, uh, courses that we offer for everybody. Thank you, Liz, appreciate that. And then last on this question is Commissioner Zabo. Thank you, Cami. The best community is an involved community. And I think I would want the community to know that the government functions best when the citizens are involved in molding the policies that govern their communities. It's important to be part of boards and commissions, public comment. Us working together will create a better community. Don't rely on government to mold your community. Be the change that you want to see. Thank you, I got Commissioner. Well, seconds left. <laughs> go for it. Do you, do you want to use it, or are you donating? Left. You're donating it. That's very generous. Well, Thank I you. I told you I'd do that, Cami. You are so good. Thank you. All right. Last question for today is for our mayor, and the question is going to be: What is the single most transformative thing we can focus on this year? It may sound trite, but truly caring about your neighbor and, and, and listening to them, understanding you know, what they're dealing with, uh, be it your, your business neighbor, be it your next door residential neighbor, and just caring about each other and um, being a little softer, being a little softer, listen more, talk less. Thank you, Mayor. Look at that at the end of some time donated back. So I'm gonna move into the fire round and I'll explain what that's gonna look like here in a second. But I do wanna ask all of the candidates who have joined us as attendees today, if in that chat box, you would tell us who you are and what you're running for. So we know that you were here with us today. You are gonna to wanna to make sure you check the all panelists and attendees so we can all see um, that you were here. And then I will also note that as we go through these fire rounds and all of our amazing elected officials are answering these questions, I wanna encourage you all to play in the chat box as well. So if you wanna answer the questions, one of them or all of them, we'd love to see your responses. So we'll quickly move into the fire round here. So I'll have, go forward to the questions here. So there's three questions and I'm not gonna read the questions each time. I'm just gonna call on who's gonna answer them. But the questions are, what is your vision for our community? What is one thing you wish the public knew about you or being an elected official? And then tell us something positive. So we wanna to end today on a really bright note of thinking about the positive and the good that's happening in our community. The trick with these questions is it has to be one sentence or less, preferably one word, but if you can get into one sentence or less, you are doing awesome. So we're gonna go in reverse order from how we started. And uh, Shelly Cook, you are gonna go first. Thanks, Cammie. My vision for our community is one that's more richly connected than ever before. Keep on moving through. Go through all of them at once. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, the one thing I wish people knew about uh, elected officials, it's that um, in my experience, by and large, the vast majority are, are of good intentions, they're hardworking, they're sincere, and they wanna contribute to the public good. And then uh, something positive, oh, well, that piece right there, uh, but the human adaptability is always on display in times like this. And I think that's the sort of thing we can take real heart in. So thanks, Cammie and everybody. Thank you, Shelley. Liz Tomsola. Um, my vision for the community would be to create a community where everyone has a voice and, and has a sense of belonging. One thing I wish the public knew about me um, or about being an elected official, it's fun and it's really hard. Uh, we take every comment to heart care deeply about our, our Vada neighbors. Um, personally, I think I make the best jambalaya in all of Arvada, so I'm gonna throw that out there as a cooking competition. Um, something positive. Um, I think it's a good thing that the Broncos don't have Joe Flacco anymore, so I'm ah. gonna throw that out there. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Liz. All right, Jim Whitfield. Um, so I, I, I guess my comment would be to have a sustainable community is what I'm looking forward to. That's my vision. <clears throat> and you can apply that word in, a, in about 360 you know, different directions. Um, 
I'd say about us as elected officials, um, I think a lot of times the community would look at us on the on any one of our boards or commissions or whatever <clears throat> and see us as a part of that that uh, entity um, realize that if you're a staff at apex or you're on staff at af a, uh, at our the, at our battle fire you will see us as representing the community right so we're uh, we're a little bit um you know hey and we take it on right we 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 like what we do so it's not like we don't but i just want to just that's something to convey to some people that we're, uh, we're uniquely positioned. Something positive. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to eating at more restaurants. I'm looking forward to going to more restaurants. I've been, I've been to a few and I'm looking to go into a few more. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next up is Commissioner Ty. I wasn't quite ready there. Uh, my vision for the community is, is we have a community that, that's healthy from all as, aspects of health throughout the community. Uh, one thing I wish people knew about being an elected official is that, you know, it's been a privilege to be an elected official to work with people in Jefferson County because people in Jeffco care about their community. And then something positive, you know, this country and, and this region, everyone was, was pretty divided over the last several years. If we pull together through these challenges and crises, we'll be stronger than we were before. Perfect. All right, Libby Zabo. Thank you. My vision for our community is that we have a safe place to live and that we trust our citizens to make good decisions on their behalf. Um, what people should know about me is that I believe living here in Jeffco is living the American dream. And I have had the opportunity to serve you all in the State House and on the Board of County Commissioners, and I am so blessed that I have had that opportunity to serve this community. Something positive, you know, I just wanna say, I am so proud of our community and all the citizens that through this crisis, the people of Jefferson County were resilient and it showed that they cared more about themselves than the, in the decisions that they made. And that's why our case numbers are so low today. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I will continue to encourage all of you attendees in the chat box. We've seen a couple of them come in, but tell us something positive that's happening in your world. And um, we're seeing some really bright spots on the personal and professional side of things. So please keep those coming. We all need a little lift on this Friday. Next up is Commissioner Dahl Camper. Thanks so much. Um, what is my vision for our community? I, I would say a, a thriving, healthy community where everyone has access to a stable, uh, safe housing, uh, quality health care, uh, and great schools. Um, what's one thing I wish the public knew about uh, me or being an elected official? Um, I'm only one vote of three, and everything on the Board of County Commissioners depends on teamwork, and we also wouldn't be as effective as we are, I think, without the tremendous support of a dedicated, smart, and creative staff to help us. And uh, tell, tell you something positive, I, I can't thank our community enough for the sacrifices that you've made, that our businesses have made over the last couple of months and our work together to flatten the curve. Let's keep it up and keep going. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mayor Williams. Thank you. The vision remains the same. Arvada is the best community to live, work, play, learn, and experience life. Uh, one thing I wish the public knew well, mayors are not as powerful as uh, people think we are. We don't, uh, we don't have veto power and we don't have uh, all the control. Uh, and I've got to tell you, Liz, I make a pretty good jambalaya too. So we may have to have that challenge. Uh, and, then on the po and then on the positive side, hey, it's Father's Day weekend and we're gonna have our four kids and our eight grandkids and it's gonna be a great weekend. Thank you all. That's awesome, Mayor. Thank you. And the first event we're going to hold when we can is a jambalaya cook-off. So we'll get planning on that here. Uh, Representative Titone. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, I think that really Arvada, I, I see leading the charge and in innovation and collaboration uh, through this COVID crisis. I uh, think we'll come out of it really well because of the people that we, we have here. Uh, one thing that people uh, should know about being elected official. Uh, you know, it's really a lot of work that goes into it and you wouldn't really know it, uh, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes uh, that make this job appear to be easy, but it's really uh, difficult uh, 
time. And uh, something positive, uh, well, there was a student that worked with me uh, and collaborated with me on a bill. And she's a Girl Scout and she won the highest award the Girl Scouts give, the Gold Award, and I'm really proud of her. And I want everybody to know uh, about, the, about her. Her name is Julia uh, Trujillo. That's awesome, what a great story. The next um, update is from Representative Craftsart. Thank you. So my vision for the community is that we're pulling together, we're working together, and it's about being connected. What I want people to know about me is I am accessible. I'm about pulling people together and I get things done. And the positive thing is it's going to be okay. Perfect. Thank you. New tagline for all of us. It's going to be okay. And then ending out our fire round questions with Congressman Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Kemi. Uh, the vision I have is to rebuild our uh, strong economy and maintain the wonderful quality of life uh, that we have in Colorado for generations to come. The, um, what is one thing I wish people would know about me or I think about us, and, and that is how much we love this state and the people uh, who live here. And that's why we do what we do. That's why I do that. And the last positive thing is uh, I've been able to do what's called this Local Heroes series, uh, interviewing people who've done wonderful things that during this difficult time for our community. And I'll just mention two Arvadans, uh, Dino Dardano from Hestra Gloves and Dave Snelling from the Arvada Police Department, going above and beyond the call of duty. That's the kind of people that live in Colorado. And that's why we love this place. Thank you so much, Congressman, and thank you to all of our panelists today. I'm wanting an applause function that we can give you guys a big round of applause because if it was there, we would be doing that. I appreciate all of you spending time with us today. I know that uh, everybody has a lot going on right now and taking time to come together as a community is always a good use of our time. And as a chamber, we'll continue to offer these opportunities for us to do that. As we move forward through these summer months, we will continue to do these community impact breakfasts. Um, we have topics coming up ranging from a, a state of education. So what does return to school look like in the fall? We will be moving into candidate forums starting in August as well. As we noted earlier, it is a big election year. So we appreciate all of you continuing to join us for these important conversations. And if there's ever anything that we can do from the chamber side to help you and your business, please feel free to reach out. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. And again, thank you to our amazing elected officials who joined us. Have a wonderful day. You did it, Cammy. <laughs> With two minutes to spare. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good job. Goodbye, everybody.